Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for being here. I mean all for being here. Uh, I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Kansas City Public Library, and it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you here and to have William Chafe here to talk about his excellent new uh, book, a book that the Boston Globe called this week, uh, Reflective, Raunchy, and Riveting. I want to write a book that gets that kind of press uh, myself. And I'm trying to live a life like that, just first of all. But, um, uh, but, but this book and, and, and tonight's topic uh, will uh, remind us that we have a presidential campaign going on in which there is a hue and cry about what is truth and what is fact, uh, what is fiction, what is a lie. Uh, and, uh, and, and it reminds us, uh, most of this is rhetorical exaggeration, but there was a time in American history when there were really great liars. And, and, and we're going to be reminded of that tonight. Remember Barry Goldwater talking about Richard Nixon? Well, actually, I can't tell you what Barry Goldwater said about Richard Nixon uh, because this is a family library, family television tonight. <laughs> Uh, uh, but there was a time, uh, a time when, when there were great liars. And I do want to want to quote uh, from William Chafe's uh, book, just very briefly, uh, two different parts. This is really a dual biography of Hillary and Bill, uh, of, the, of the Clintons as a family, uh, a family with a certain kind of character. Um, and so uh, here on page 150, third in dissembling about the draft, one subject only here, but uh, Bill Clinton displayed his inability to come clean about personal issues that were at the core of his identity. Sometimes he outright lied. More often he shaded the truth. Always he seemed to feel entitled to construct events or recall experiences in ways that worked to his own benefit. And then you wonder, I, I happened to be at Yale as an undergraduate when they were in the law school together, and you know, one, one wonders about the attraction and then re one reads this the second uh, a bit from page 256, uh, which is about Ken Starr interviewing Hillary Clinton. And I could tell you a story about Ken Starr, who I had dinner with at precisely this time, uh, but I won't because that would make this go on too long. In the end, Kenneth Starr determ determined that he did not have enough evidence to indict Hillary Clinton. Examples of disingenuous statements, evasive disclaimers, and outright obfuscation were abundant. Something irregular, improper, and perhaps illegal had taken place in Arkansas with the First Lady, much more than her husband, at the heart of it. Anyway, so you do understand the attraction the Clintons had for each other. Um, I, I want to... Thank you. I'm quoting from our author, William Chafe, who, who is one of the great historians of American liberalism. No comment about that. Notice I'm restrained, uh, and, 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 of, and of gender uh, and racial equality in the history of this country. Uh, he's a, a historian with a PhD from Columbia, uh, a, a dean and, and the Alice Mary Baldwin uh, professor of history at Duke University, the author of a number of excellent books. And I'd like to, to, to end my introduction on a more nonpartisan note, you'll be happy to know. Uh, uh, I've read one of his previous books, wh which was a book that I really, really liked uh, about a man, uh, a great liberal, uh, uh, at, at his core, uh, a great left liberal, a man named Allard Lowenstein. Uh, and, and Bill Chafer wrote uh, a book about him called Never Stop Running. And Allard Lowenstein uh, it, it was one of the people uh, responsible for uh, the creation of a, a, a new left movement, if you will, in American uh, politics. But he was also a man who embraced larger ideas uh, of American politics, uh, symbolized by the, by the fact that uh, at his funeral, he was killed by a deranged, uh, uh, mentally uh, defective uh, colleague of, uh, of his at the age of 51 in his office. Uh, but at his funeral, uh, uh, eulogies were made back to back by Teddy Kennedy and Bill Buckley. Uh, and uh, that, that's a time in, in American politics and American history that, uh, that we could fondly remember after the last decade or two uh, of complete partisanship. Uh, and it's something that, that William Chafe has written eloquently about uh, as he writes eloquently uh, about the problems of the, of the Clinton family uh, in, in this uh, book, Bill and Hillary, The Politics of the Personal. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome William Chafe. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to see this audience. I am deeply grateful. I am extremely impressed. Uh, I thought I'd begin by telling you a little bit about 
my career and how I came to write this book. As has been indicated before, I didn't start as a biographer. I started as a social historian. I wrote four books about women's history and the women's movement, and I wrote books about the civil rights movement. Uh, and only toward the last 10 years, 15 years, have I started to zero in on questions of what makes an individual try to change history. But I would argue that this is actually a very strong coherence in all of this. Because when you're writing about social movements, for example, when I was writing about the four sit-in students who led the sit-in movement uh, and sat down at Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina in February 1st, 1960, I was really dealing with what happened to those four people. How did they make up their minds to put their lives on the line? Now, when they did that, within nine weeks, there were similar demonstrations in 54 cities in nine different states. A new phase of the civil rights revolution had happened because four young individuals decided to make history. Well, that got me really interested in the role of the individual in making history. And uh, I, I did write this biography of Ella Lowenstein because in some respects, it helped to highlight uh, what makes someone come to the point of acting decisively to intervene uh, in historical uh, uh, moments and change things. And so over time, I have come to value the idea of the personal and the political feeding each other, coming together. I wrote a book called Private Lives, Public Consequences, which started off with an essay on, Frederick, on, on Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt, and then ended with an essay on Bill and Hillary Clinton. And the more I looked at the Clintons, the more I became aware of how incredibly important their personal chemistry was, not only to their lives together, but to shaping the history of uh, the last quarter of the 20th century. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Because at the heart of their relationship is the way in which they functioned together, the way in which their chemistry interacted with each other, in order to create the kind of partnership that ultimately led them to uh, a very critical period of uh, being in charge of our country. Where does it all begin? Well, it all begins with their childhoods, of course. And one of the things we have to recognize is that at least in the case of Bill Clinton, we're talking about one of the most dysfunctional childhoods that could ever exist. Uh, Bill's mother, Virginia, was an amazing woman. She writes in her own autobiography about the fact that every morning she spent 90 minutes, nine zero minutes, putting makeup on. Why was she doing that? She tells you in her autobiography. She was doing that so that she could hide who she really was. She really did not want to come to grips with who she was. She had a very difficult relationship with her mother. She loved her father, as did Bill, who had a very difficult relationship with her mother, but loved uh, his grandfather. Um, and Virginia was just a very interesting person, not willing to confront some of the realities of her life. So she went off to school, and she met a man named Bill Blythe, who told her he was a salesman. Uh, and they fell in love. They married two months later. He went off then to Italy. He'd never been a salesman. He'd always been in the Army. She didn't know until 40 years later that he'd been married three times, had children with those other wives, and was still married when he married her. When he came back from Italy, he was killed driving back from Chicago toward Arkansas to see uh, Virginia. Bill had not been born, and he was killed in an all Bill accident that was very tragic. Virginia then went back to school, late, leaving Bill to be raised by his grandmother and grandfather for the first two years. And then she fell in love with another person named Roger Clinton. Roger Clinton, she also did not know, had been married four times, and had been accused in one of the divorce cases against him of physical abuse of his spouse. They both liked to drink. They both liked to party. They both were flirtatious. But soon, it became clear that this was a family where alcoholism and abuse were normative. They were part of daily life. Bill is raised in that family. And Bill becomes the instrument of saving that family. He frequently comes upon his stepfather, Roger,